The President of Ireland, Mary McAleese. A Hailsha Banrian, a Wargak Drega, a Hushig, a Prevaira, a Kedaira, Tanashta, Runi Groha Actraha, a Gazaena Erika, Faram Kedmila Falcher of Trinona, a Kashlan Balia Clea, Er Okad, a Ta Harave Specialta, Er Fad. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness Tishuk, Prime Minister, First Minister, Tanashta, Foreign Secretary, distinguished guests. It's my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to Dublin Castle this evening on the first ever state visit to take place between our two countries. This visit is a culmination of the success of the peace process. It is an acknowledgement that while we none of us can change the past, we have chosen to change the future. The relationship between our two countries is long, it is complex, it has often been turbulent. Like the tides that surround each of us, we have shaped and altered each other. This evening, we celebrate a new chapter in our relationship that may still be a work in progress, but happily has become a work of progress of partnership, of friendship. The contemporary British-Irish relationship is multifaceted, strongly underpinned by the most common and most important connection of all, people and families. Large numbers of British-born people live here in Ireland. Many more of our citizens have Irish backgrounds, British backgrounds, ancestry and identity. In Britain, those of Irish birth, descent or identity are numbered in millions. The two-way flow of people between these islands goes back millennia. This very room is dedicated to the name of St. Patrick. His name, of course, is synonymous around the world with Ireland. Yet he is reputed to have been born in Britain. Patrick's life as the man who brought Christianity to Ireland is illustrative of the considerable exchange of ideas and knowledge that there has been between our two nations throughout history. It has been a fascinating two-way street, with Britain bestowing on Ireland our system of common law, parliamentary tradition, independent civil service, gracious Georgian architecture, love of English literature, and our obsession with premiership football. <laughs> Conversely, Britain greatly benefited from the Irish genius of the likes of Edmund Burke, the Duke of Wellington, Daniel O'Connell, Charles Stuart Parnell, Maria Edgeworth, Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw, even Father Ted. Indeed, it was Shaw who wryly observed that England had conquered Ireland, so there was nothing for it but to come over and conquer England. However, I think even Shaw might not have dared to imagine that this cultural conquest would come in time to include rugby and cricket. I promise not to mention them again this evening. <laughs> well, not much anyway. The Irish in Britain and the British in Ireland, both as individuals and as communities, have made an invaluable contribution to both our homelands, while also cementing the links between us. Today, those links provide the foundation for a thriving economic relationship. As close trade and investment partners and as partners in the European Union, Britain and Ireland are essential to each other's economic well-being. It is imperative that we work fluently together to promote the conditions that stimulate prosperity and opportunity for all our people. It is only right, though, that on this historic visit, we should reflect on the difficult centuries which have brought us to this point. Inevitably, where there are the colonizers and the colonized, the past is a repository of sources of bitter division. The harsh facts cannot be altered, nor loss nor grief erased. But with time and generosity, interpretations and perspectives can soften and open up space 
for new accommodations. Yesterday, Your Majesty, you visited our Garden of Remembrance and laid there a wreath in honour of the sacrifice and achievement of those who fought against Britain for Irish independence. Today at Island Bridge, just as we did at the Island of Ireland Peace Park at Messina in 1998, we commemorated together the thousands of Irish men who gave their lives in British uniform in the Great War. As the first citizen of Ireland, like my fellow countrymen and women, I am deeply proud of Ireland's difficult journey to national sovereignty. I'm proud of how we have used our independence to build a republic which asserts the religious and civil liberty, equal rights, equal opportunities, not just of all its citizens, but of all human beings. I'm particularly proud of this island's peacemakers, who having experienced firsthand the appalling toxic harvest of failing to resolve old hatreds and political differences, rejected the perennial culture of conflict and compromised in this generation enough to let a new future in. The Good Friday Agreement represented a fresh start and committed all of us to partnership, equality and mutual respect as the basis of future relationships. Under the agreement, unionism and nationalism were accorded equal recognition as political aspirations and philosophies. Northern Ireland's status within the United Kingdom was solemnly recognised, as was the option for a united Ireland if that secures the agreement and consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland at some time in the future. The collegial and cooperative relationship between the British and Irish governments was crucial to the success of the peace process. And we can thank the deepening engagement between us as equal partners in the European Union for the growth of friendship and trust. The governments, the two governments, collaborative efforts to bring peace and power sharing to Northern Ireland have yielded huge dividends for the peoples of these two islands. W.B. Yeats once wrote in a completely different context that peace comes dropping slow. The journey to peace has been cruelly slow and arduous, but it has taken us to a place where hope thrives and the past no longer threatens to overwhelm our present or our future. The legacy of the Good Friday Agreement is already profound and encouraging. And we, all of us, have a duty to protect, nurture and develop it. Your Majesty, from our previous conversations, I know of your deep support for the peace process. I know of your longing to see relationships between our two countries sustained on a template of good neighbourliness. Your visit here is an important sign among a growing number of signs that we have indeed embarked on the fresh start envisaged in the Good Friday Agreement. Your visit is a formal recognition of what has, for many years, been a reality, a lived reality, that Ireland and Britain are neighbours, equals, colleagues, friends. Though the seas between us have often been stormy, we have chosen to build a solid, and enduring bridge of friendship between us and to cross it to a new and a happier future. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, it is in that spirit of mutual respect and warm friendship, it is in faith in that future that I offer you the traditional warm Irish welcome, Cade Mila Falcha, 100,000 welcomes. May I now invite all of our guests to stand and please join me in a toast. <clears throat> to the health and happiness of Her Majesty and His Royal Highness, to the well-being and prosperity of the people of Britain, to the cause of peace and reconciliation on this island, and to friendship and kinship forever between the peoples of Ireland and Britain.
health. Your good health. Your very good health. Slauncher. Slauncher. Slauncher.